the bold claim of artificial intelligence is that even when you design a system that is physiologically unrealistic, psychologically unrealistic, you may still be able to extract from the highest levels of analysis of the problem some principles that will transfer. You may be able to get some concepts out of this engineering exercise that will be fruitful when applied to the uh, empirical investigation of how we do it. But this is always what happens in the making of models or the making of machines which do various tasks uh, f uh, from which we can draw fruitful analogies. One doesn't want to say that they're identical to our natural processes. I mean, for example, the, I mean, the idea, for, for instance, that the mechanical uh, force pump has things in common with has features in common with the heart would not make one want to say that uh, the heart itself is driven in the same way. But we can extract at a high level of abstraction certain principles which are are common to both. Oh yes, and I think uh, you'd know more about this than I would. But I believe that the the actual development of things like pumps mm -hmm. had a had an important uh, inspiring and elucidating effect on on the. Uh, development of interesting physiological hypotheses. Well, now, is it true to say then, therefore, that the science of the artificial as applied to intelligence, that the simulation of intelligent procedures by mechanical devices has actually helped us and in, in, in understanding what we do in the way in which we grasp the world, handle it and understand it and so forth, or, and, and are there <coughs> limits to, to what we can learn? Yes. Um, I think that it has helped. I think it's been fruitful, but you have to look in the right place. Uh, if you look at the actual hardware products of artificial intelligence, they're a relatively unimpressive lot. They're a bag of tricks, pretty much. And uh, even when they do mimic a human being, it's usually for spurious reasons. They've, they've put a bunch of tricks in there to make it seem more human than it really is. Uh, but one shouldn't judge the field by those um, gimmicks and illustrations, which is really all they are. The real products of the field are conceptual. They are, uh, in fact, that's why I'm interested in it, is it looks very much like philosophy. When you, when you look at the theoretical discussions of the people in AI, you see that they are dealing with issues that have been around since Descartes, since Hume, since Kant, and they're dealing with them with new conceptual resources, new ideas, new methods, and with a greater sensitivity to the ultimate problem of taking those semantic engines, these mm. systems of information processing, and actually making something physical that can do all those wonderful things that a semantic engine clearly can do. Uh, I think that uh, perhaps the best example of this, and it's a very abstract mm. point, is something that I call Hume's problem. Mm -hmm. uh, not because Hume solved it, but because he labored mightily uh, Hume wanted to have a theory of the mind, and like others before him, like Locke and Descartes, he had his basic building blocks, he called them ideas. Mm -hmm. you know, he had impressions and ideas. And they were like little pictures, mm -hmm. little mental pictures. They represented in virtue of, of uh, resembling. Mm -hmm. The idea of a cow was cow-shaped, mm -hmm. presumably. I mean, yes. That's roughly the way it seemed to work. He was conveniently vague about that. Now. He couldn't imagine how a mind could work without filling it with lots of these little representations, which he called ideas. But he also recognized that a representation, something like a picture, doesn't really do any work. It, does, it doesn't, isn't any good. It isn't really a representation at all, unless there's a sort of observer, a sort of agent that's looking at it and appreciating it mm. and understanding it. Uh, if you put a road map under the, under the bonnet of a car. Uh, this is, this is a, a utterly futile, mm. unless you've also got some wonderful gadget under the bonnet that's, that's going to look at that in some way and uh, interpret it, perhaps, in order to uh, keep the car on the road or something like that. Otherwise, you, you, you've got a, an entirely gratuitous attempt at representation. There. Mm. So Hume saw that representations without representation users mm -hmm. uh, were, were sort of uh, uh, futile. But he also saw that if he put then a, a smart observer in there to look at the, at the ideas, then we had the problem simply postponed. What was in that smart observer's head? More ideas? 
and another little tinier observer watching them, and we generate an infinite regress of representations and users watchers and, and watchers and the representations in their heads and mm. so forth ad infinitum. Now, that particular bogey, that fear of that regress has loomed large ever since Hume. Mm. And, uh, for instance, it was a major impetus to behaviorism. Mm -hmm. You find Skinner telling about this infinite regress and how, uh, how preposterous it is. And Ryle as well. Uh, and Ryle as well, yes. Uh, uh, theorists, virtually every theorist that I can think of, has had a, 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 at least a tacit appreciation of the power of this, uh, the danger of this idea. You, as soon as you introduce representations, you seem to be off on an infinite regress. And there the situation would sit, I think, were it not for the advent of artificial intelligence, who showed us a way out. They haven't shown us the way we do it, but they've shown an abstract way out of this problem. And that's because they saw a way of uh, uh, doing with representation something that at first looks miraculous. As a student of mine once said, Hume's problem was to get the ideas to think for themselves. Uh -huh. <laughs> and that really was his problem. And he, he couldn't solve it. He, he didn't want to have a self in there to do the work, and he couldn't see how to get the ideas to do the work for themselves. But that's just what AI, what artificial intelligence, has given us some models of. The idea is you start at the top with your whole intelligent being with all of the beliefs and desires and expectations and fears, all the information. And then you say, how is that going to be represented in there? Well, you break it down into subsystems, little homunculi, mm -hmm. little men in the brain. Each one has, is a specialist. It does a little bit of the work. It does have its own representations that it does consult, really, in effect. Uh, but why doesn't, and then, of course, the, these uh, uh, subsystems are in a sort of society of interacting parts that cooperate and uh, out of their cooperative endeavors emerge the whole activity, so the whole system. But while one actually introduces the notion of homunculi, yes. one, one isn't sneaking in through the back door in place of an infinite regress of spectators and representations, um, a crowd of spectators who are each of them observing their own little tiny province, because well, that is, that's another way of, of, of being mentalistic in the way that is so alarmed Hume, is it not? Yes, but the difference is that you do. You replace the little man in the brain with the committee. The, but the saving grace is that the committee, the members of the committee, are stupider than the whole. They are less intelligent. They know less. They, they are, you don't reproduce all of the talents of the whole. That would lead you to an infinite regress. Mm -hmm. You have each subsystem doing a part so that each homuncular subsystem is less intelligent, knows less, believes less, and the representations are themselves, as it were, less representational. And so uh, the, the uh, uh, you don't need an inner eye exactly. You can get away with a, some sort of an inner processor which accesses them in some more uh, attenuated sense. And uh, take, a, take a chess playing computer, mm -hmm. you say, well now we'll break that down into a number of experts. We have a, a, a move generator, a bright idea person, and then we have a move critic who will uh, criticize the moves generated by the move generator, and then you have a, a referee who makes sure the rules are being obeyed, and then you have a timekeeper who make sure that nobody spends too much time on any one job. And then if you look at the critic, who's got just some of the information, mm. and look at him more closely, you see that he's broken down into a whole lot of little stupider subcritics, each one doing a little job. There's one that simply decides um, whether the bishop is worth uh, sacrificing at this time. That's not, in fact, a very good decomposition. Mm. But it, you, you get specialists, mm. and as we all know, uh, specialists know sort of more and more about less and less. And these, in fact, know not very much about very little. But put together into large armies, sort of nested like Chinese boxes, mm. you can get out of the whole system a behavior which looks distinctly uh, intelligent, distinctly human. Now, although one uses the vocabulary of knowing or believing for each of these uh, Conjuries and uh, yes. little assemblies. That is not to say that they are, as it were, in states of mind about 
uh, whatever it is they know. I mean, it, it, it doesn't make, it isn't a claim of anything more than to say that uh, uh, they have a repertoire of uh, abilities to discriminate uh, given alternative situations. That's right. That's right. They're not supposed to be full-blooded, conscious mind-havers or minds at all. No, they're, 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 uh, uh, they're, they are diminished minds. They are only quasi-minds. They are only, uh, uh, if you like, pseudo-minds. Now, you see, one has a, there's a, there's a purely, uh, uh, there's a debate which is finely just lexicographic. Mm. One can say, well, in that case, they really don't represent at all. They don't really have rep mental representations that they manipulate at all. But if that's the way you go, then you say, well, turns out that we don't really need mental representation to explain the mind. Pseudo-representation will do just as well. On the other hand, you can say, well, I guess representation was not quite such a marvelous and mysterious thing as we thought. If you can have representation in a computer, then maybe uh, uh, we can harmonize the idea that the mind is a system of representations with the idea that the mind is just the brain. It's just ultimately a physical organ with lots of little parts. So that one could imagine then some sort of um, hyper elaborate machine which was capable of doing uh, and accomplishing most of the repertoire which we think of as being distinctively human without in fact having to attribute to that machine some sort of self-conscious uh, state of mind or a screen in which its overall operations were represented to itself. Yes, um, the, there's a uh, strong inclination when one starts playing with models of this sort to always exempt the self and say, well, maybe, maybe I do have all of these little subsystems in me, but then there's the, there's the king subsystem, there's mm. the boss, there's the one at the center who knows it all and who controls all the others, and that's the really wonderful and mysterious one. That's the, that's the, the seat of the soul. Mm. Um, but I think that's a bad mistake. Mm. Uh, that's a very controversial claim that that's mm. a bad mistake. It's an immensely compelling idea. Uh, but I, for one, have uh, been trying to get people out of the idea that that's compelling and get them to see how there's in fact good empirical evidence mm. to suggest that there isn't any king homunculus, there isn't any all-knowing central boss I at all. The, uh, uh, to, to revert to the uh, intelligence, the counterintelligence, mm. the spy analogy again, uh, what we want here is a principle like the, the CIA's principle of need to know. Mm. Uh, your agents in the field uh, only need to know a little bit, and you don't let them know any more than they need to know to do their jobs. Uh, the, the rationale there, of course, mm. is you, if, if they get caught, you don't want them unraveling the whole system. Mm. The rationale in, in, the, in the case of the mind is rather different. It's that only by building up a whole system out of proper parts, which are genuinely proper parts that only do part of the work, mm. can you avoid the infinite regress which is threatened by uh, Hume's problem. Mm. Now, if we take that idea to its conclusion, it would seem that there shouldn't be any homunculus, any subsystem which is itself uh, in charge. Uh, it's going to be too powerful. It, we're going to get an infinite regress if we start mm. putting something like that in. And in fact, I think there's lots of evidence now, uh, somewhat disturbing evidence, in fact, that shows that if there were any homunculus in our cognitive committee with which we would be inclined to identify the self intuitively, it wouldn't be the boss. It would be the director of public relations, the man in the press office, who has only a very limited and, and, and often even fallacious idea about what's really going on in the system. But he's the one whose job it is to present a good face to the world, to issue press releases, and generally try to tell everybody on the outside what's going on. Uh, he can be wrong. He can be massively misinformed. He can be massively ignorant mm. of what's really going on in the system. 
and uh, many results uh, of experiments in cognitive psychology and in social psychology now strongly suggest that our own access to what's going on in our minds is very impoverished. Mm. We often confabulate, we tell, we tell unwitting lies, mm. we often are just in the dark, we have no idea at all, and so the, uh, the sense which was uh, overpoweringly obvious to somebody like John Locke or, or Descartes, that the mind is transparent to itself, that each one of us is the ultimate authority on everything that's going on in our minds, we are incorrigible, infallible observers of our own mental life, has been completely overthrown. Now, uh, as the American philosopher Keith Gunderson once put it, it seems we have underprivileged access to the uh, goings-on in our own minds. Uh, we make mistakes about even what we're thinking. And this underprivileged access that we have to our own minds is not because of what Freud said, that we are, as it were, actively prevented from gaining access to our own minds, but more because it is, it is a constitutive character of having a mind at all, yes. that nine-tenths of it is, in fact, as it were, subterranean machinery, uh, yes. which it, it would be impossible to know. Yes. And, and you see, this is the thing that was hidden from the classical representation theorists like Descartes and Hume, because they conducted the entire enterprise at the purely semantic level, where they have thoughts and ideas which were just pure meaning, in effect, pure reference, pure intentionality, to use a jargon term, and they never really addressed themselves, they didn't know how, to the question of how could anything actually perform these functions? How could anything as marvelous as a mental representation actually work. It was convenient for them to say, well, it's all done in the non-physical mind, and, and that's beyond the can of science. Now that we are embarked, uh, for better or for worse, on the research project of trying to understand the brain as the mind, we have to raise these questions. And the the beauty of it is that once we raise them, particularly, I think, in the top-down approach, we uncover new problems. We uncover new issues. And some of the old home truths of the introspective uh, psychologies of everybody since Descartes uh, no longer seem true, even. And uh, in particular, the idea that each of us is a, a is a sort of infallible explorer of his own mind and can just read off what his ideas are. It's just that that very idea is, is just no longer as compelling once these new results begin to come in.